everybody and welcome to our session on developing quantum algorithms and running them on Azure Quantum. My name is Maria Mikhailova. I'm a senior software engineer on Microsoft Quantum team working on education and outreach. Later in the session, I will be joined by Brian Nienhaus of Honeywell Quantum Solutions, one of our great partners in Azure Quantum, who will tell us more about uh, Honeywell's work in this domain. I'm a classically trained software engineer, so my work on helping people learn quantum computing and making it hands-on and engaging is near and dear to my heart. In today's session, we will start by taking a look at the tools and the ecosystem we are building in Azure Quantum and their role in the ongoing quantum computing research. Next. I will take you through a demo of an end-to-end -end workflow of developing a quantum program from writing the actual code to running it on quantum hardware. Next, Brian will tell you more about the Honeywell system available through Azure Quantum and share a new case study done by our customers and solution partners that uh, performs some chemical experimentation on Honeywell system. Finally, we will share some pointers on how you can get started with quantum computing today. Azure Quantum is a single point of entry to a variety of tools for quantum computing, both software and hardware, developed by Microsoft and by our network of amazing partners. We together are building an open ecosystem that you can use to start experimenting with quantum computing today and take your learnings and your developments to the future in which mature quantum computers are going to help humanity solve its biggest problems. The question is, what are these problems going to be? There are quite a lot of algorithms that offer some kind of quantum speed up over their classical counterparts. And one of the more interesting directions of quantum computing research today is figuring out which of those algorithms are going to end up practical, helping us solve problems, and which are going to remain theoretical. And this is where our tools come in. Using these tools, we can take an algorithm that used to exist only on paper and implement it, run it and experiment with it, and understand enough about it to make this distinction practical or not so much. When we start doing this work on different algorithms, we learn that a lot of them that are commonly associated with quantum computing are overhyped and uh, chances are that they are not going to be as important as it was originally thought. This means that it's really important to keep uh, developing our quantum software tools and to use them in quantum computing research to make sure that we can pass through this maze to the problems that are going to actually be solvable using quantum computers. Now, what does a quantum software development workflow look like? First of all, we have to note that quantum programs don't exist in a vacuum. Rather, they are parts of a hybrid quantum classical workflows in which the whole process of solving a problem is broken into steps and classical and quantum components solve the steps that are best suited to be solved by them. So classical software can do things like input preparation for the quantum program and analyzing its result. And the quantum program is going to solve that one part of the problem that is perfectly suited for getting quantum speed up. In more detail, our workflow looks something like this. We start, of course, by writing the quantum code using Q Sharp, our domain-specific programming language. And to do this, you're going to use Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, the editors you're using daily anyways. Our quantum development kit libraries help you keep your code high level and help you make writing your quantum program as easy as possible. Those libraries, similar to the classical programming language libraries, do a lot of heavy lifting of 
low-level implementation of the algorithm for you and allow you to focus on the high-level logic of your program. Next, we are going to integrate our quantum programs with classical software. You can use uh, languages such as Python or .NET languages for this, which means you can easily take advantage of all the advances classical computing made in the past 70 years. Once you are done writing your quantum program, you're going to use a very quantum-specific tool, quantum simulators. A quantum simulator is a classical software that simulates the logical behavior of a quantum system which means you can use it to run your program on a small instance of inputs without hitting hardware yet, just to make sure that it does what you expect it to do. This is extremely useful for doing things like learning quantum computing or writing unit tests for your program. But simulators are limited in the size of the systems they can simulate, which means that to get actual quantum advantage, you still need that quantum hardware. And to figure out whether your program is ready to run on today's quantum hardware, whether it fits its specifications, you can use another tool, Resource Estimator, which is going to analyze your program and tell how much resources it needs to run, how many qubits it needs, and how long executing this program is going to take. Once you have convinced yourself that indeed your problem can fit within the specifications of one of the existing hardware systems available through Azure Quantum, that's what you do next. You go to Azure Quantum and you run your program on quantum hardware. And in today's demo, I will walk you through all of these steps of quantum software development. One final thing to note here is that all these steps use exactly the same quantum code. You don't modify your code depending on where you want to run it locally in simulation on your laptop or in the cloud on quantum hardware. You just use the same code throughout all the workflow steps. For today's demo, we uh, prepared a program example inspired by quantum chemistry. Computational chemistry solves problems such as modeling molecular properties and behaviors based on its chemical composition. Current algorithms that are state-of-the-art in this domain are classical. They are very computationally heavy, and they are still limited to modeling only smaller molecules. They don't let us model uh, really big, complex, and interesting molecules. In the future, once we have our scalable, fault-tolerant quantum systems available, we are going to be able to use quantum equivalents of those algorithms to get really accurate models of more complicated molecules. But with the currently existing hardware, it's just not possible. So for this demo, we developed very simplified algorithm that's going to approximately evaluate the energy of hydrogen molecule for us. Now, it's not going to be chemically accurate. It's not going to outperform what we could do with a classical computer. At the same time, it's going to run on quantum hardware which means it's really useful for experimenting with it and for learning about it. And now it's time for the demo. First of all, let's see the first two steps of our workflow, the quantum code for solving our problems and the quantum development kit libraries used to write this code. Here is the whole code we used for this exact quantum solution for modeling the energy of hydrogen molecule. You see that it's a very non-trivial problem to solve, but it actually fits in just one screen. This is due to liberal use of quantum development kit libraries. Both general purpose libraries, such as phase estimation, that are used as a building block in multiple quantum algorithms, and domain-specific uh, chemistry libraries such as preparing the state to estimate the energy of and the actual energy estimation routines. You can see that using the libraries allows you to write your code at a really high level 
without going down to the routine operations such as qubit allocation. You also see that editing the code in Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, you get a lot of normal IDE features such as syntax highlight and IntelliSense. Now, let's see how this quantum code is used in combination with our classical Python code to actually solve our problem. Uh, to help you follow along and map the things that are happening in the notebook with the steps of the workflow, we have those colored tags that remind you which workflow step we are in right now. We start, of course, by loading some libraries, which I have already done beforehand. Now we can use our classical software tools to do things such as visualizing the geometry of the molecule. So far, nothing quantum happened, but taking advantage of existing tools can be really convenient for us. Next, we're going to load the molecule properties and to run our program on a local simulator to estimate the energy of this molecule. We do this simulation using this kind of call. This is the name of our quantum operation and we could simulate on it with the right parameters. This is the energy of the actual ground state of the hydrogen molecule we are aiming for. For the next step, we are going to estimate the resources necessary to run the same code on a quantum device. You see that we are using the same Q-sharp code, just with a different call, estimate resources instead of simulate. We get a lot of uh, parameters for the quantum program out of here. The key ones are the qubit count, and that one's not too bad. On five qubits, we do have this on our quantum systems. But this uh, CNOT count, which is effectively the number of entanglements you need to perform during your program, that's almost 100,000. That's way too much for the existing quantum hardware to handle. So we're not going to be able to run the precise algorithm on our hardware, not quite yet. Let's now switch to the approximation algorithm that is going to give us slightly worse results, but it's going to be runnable on our hardware. Again, we start by executing the cell which loads the molecular description and defines some helper operations we're going to use for post-processing our results. Next, we do resource estimation again, but for different quantum program. In this approximation, we're going to split up this big computation into multiple smaller ones, run them independently, and then combine their results after the quantum programs are done running. If we estimate the resources necessary for one of those jobs, we see that the number of qubits is still five, which is still good. But the number of C nodes, the number of entanglements we need to do, is much, much smaller. And that we can actually run on our hardware. So let's do just that. To submit uh, jobs to our cloud simulators and our quantum hardware, we need to connect to Azure Quantum. If you worked with Azure, you're going to see a lot of familiar terms here, such as subscription and resource group. I have already done the connection here. And in this test workspace, we have just one provider added, which has two targets, IonQ simulator and IonQ uh, QPU, the actual quantum device. Let's start by running the same code on the cloud simulator. We usually want to do this before hitting the hardware to make sure that our job submission process is right, that our post-processing is right, basically to work out all the workflow steps beyond the actual hardware execution. Now that we set uh, the target to IonQ simulator, any jobs we submit are going to be submitted to the simulator. And let's do just that, submit jobs for each piece of our computation and get the results. While we're doing this, allow me to say a couple more words about the approximation we are using. We are doing two steps to split this big computation into several smaller ones. First, we are changing the state of the hydrogen molecule we are trying to estimate from the ground state 
to a state very close to it, but that is much, much simpler to prepare. And second, for this simpler state, we split the expression for the energy of that state into multiple terms with different coefficients. We evaluate each term separately and then combine them together using classical post-processing. Another interesting thing here is this parameter shots. Quantum algorithms are very often probabilistic, non-deterministic. So if you run it once and you do a measurement in the end, there is not zero probability that you are not going to get the result you're looking for. So what we do in this case, we run the algorithm multiple times. Each run is called the shot. And we collect statistics based on those multiple runs. And then we process those statistics to figure out the most likely outcome, which is the answer we are looking for. So you see, we have successfully submitted multiple jobs to the simulator, and we got the results back. Now the only step that is left is aggregating these results into one number using the Python function we defined earlier. You see that this number is slightly off from the one we got in the exact simulation because we are estimating the energy of a different state, not the ground state, but the one that is very close to it. Now, let's see the jobs executed on NQ hardware. And submitting to hardware is as easy as just switching the target for our jobs from INQ simulator to INQ QPU. After this, submitting the jobs looks exactly the same like we did it for the simulator. I could be running the previous cell instead of defining a new one. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to submit those jobs. Instead, I'm going to use the jobs that we ran when preparing the demo. You can see that uh, each of these jobs was running on INQ QPU target, so quantum hardware, and each of them took something like seven minutes between its creation time and its execution time. Most of this time was spent in the queue, waiting for hardware to be available. And of course, all of those jobs succeeded. So now we can use the results of those jobs to aggregate them into the energy and to get our final number of this demo. You see that this number is not exactly the same as we got in the simulation a moment ago. And this is to be expected. The present day quantum systems are still noisy and this noise impacts our results. At the same time, this number was received by running actual jobs on real quantum hardware. Just, just how exciting is it? To summarize what we have just seen in this demo, first, Throughout our work, we are using a familiar ecosystem of tools. You have seen we used Visual Studio, Python, Azure. So, as we mentioned before, quantum computing is not going to be standalone. Rather, it's going to be just one more tool in the toolbox you're using daily. Second, we have seen how quantum programs integrate easily with classical software packages, allowing for this hybrid workflow to work seamlessly. And finally, you saw that at all steps of the demo, we used the same quantum code to run it, both on simulators and resource estimators locally, and on simulators and on hardware in the cloud. In this demo, we have been using cloud simulators and quantum hardware by INQ, one of our great partners in Azure Quantum. We have multiple hardware partners there, and another one of them is uh, Honeywell. And now allow me to introduce Brian Ninehouse of Honeywell Quantum Solutions, who will tell us more about their work. Brian, you have the floor. Thank you, Maria. Uh, my name is Brian Ninehouse. I'm an experimental atomic physicist uh, who, after a postdoc doing uh, quantum simulation and quantum computation on trapped atomic ions, uh, found myself accidentally employable. Uh, and so now I'm at Honeywell Quantum Solutions, where I lead the commercial operations uh, group, 
uh, where we run, uh, maintain, and operate and upgrade our uh, commercial quantum computers. Uh, and that includes dealing with uh, our customers. And so I'll be able to tell you a little bit today about one of the projects that was done there, and also tell you a little bit about how our systems work. Our computer is based on trapped atomic ions. Our qubit is the two internal states of a Euterbium 171 ion. And we use ions just because once an electron's been ripped off an atom, they're easy to grab onto and move around uh, by applying voltages to those little rectangles on that chip shown on the left there. Now, the, the qubit is actually stored in two internal states of this Euterbium ion. Uh, we use two hyperfine states, and these are what are called clock states. These are the same states that in the cesium atom define the second. Uh, so very stable states, and we can manipulate them using laser beams. We also have some barium atoms that are around for the ride, but they're not doing any neat quantum things. They're just around to cool our euterbium atoms as we shuffle them around uh, the trap. So our architecture is sometimes referred to as a QCCD architecture, a quantum charge coupled device architecture. And that's because we can move our qubits around. We can shuffle them around this, this trap in a similar way to how electrons are shuttled around a CCD sensor at the back of your digital camera. Right, and be able to move and fully program the position of our qubits has a lot of great advantages. On this next slide, I'll show you that some of those advantages include the native ability to do all to all interactions. You don't have to worry about which qubits are where on the device because it's completely programmable. Whichever two qubit gates you specify, we just move those two qubits together and then we, we perform that gate in a single step. And this is in great contrast to other devices that have a fixed nearest neighbor connectivity if you want to link up the information from one side of the trap to the other, it requires many logical swap operations, each which come with error. But on our device with all-doll connectivity, uh, you don't have to worry about where the qubit is located. It's completely programmable, and all, all qubit pairings have exactly the same fidelity because it's all a single interaction step. Having able to move around the qubits also allows us to do mid-circuit measurement and then qubit reuse. So because we can move our qubits around, if we want to measure a qubit in the middle of the circuit, we can move all the other qubits out of the way, measure the qubit we're after, and the other qubits uh, keep their quantum state intact. So we can extract some information without completely destroying all the information in the quantum processor. And then we can even reuse the qubit we just measured to continue on with the algorithm. So not only is this very important and useful in reducing the qubit resources you need in the early days when the qubit numbers are relatively limited, but it also allows you to do conditional logic. This is the quantum if statement. You can measure something about your circuit and then make a decision in real time based upon the outcome of that measurement. And this is 100% necessary for quantum error correction. So everyone has to invent this eventually, but with the QCCD architecture, it's really quite simple to do because we can just move the qubits we want to protect out of the way when we do a measurement. Similarly, having this movable qubits gives us uh, a native ability to have very high fidelity gates. When we do a two qubit gate, which is sort of the basic building block of a quantum circuit, uh, it's just the two qubits we care about in this, in this well all by themselves to do a gate interacting with the laser beam. And so it's a very clean and pristine system uh, and we get very high fidelity two qubit gates. But additionally, as we add more and more qubits to our trap, uh, the interaction remains the same. All the additional qubits that have been added are are shuffled way out of the way where they don't get in the, the way of the qubits we're trying to gate. We have very low crosstalk uh, and interference from those other qubits. So as we scale these systems up, uh, we expect the fidelity to remain the same. And this high fidelity is, is really important to not only in the future, but for applications you can do today with these smaller quantum computers. And on the next slide, we can show you an example of this that we worked on with our partners at Cunisys uh, and Enios, uh, both based in Japan. So here, the goal was to simulate molecular vibration modes of two small molecules, in this case, water and methanol. Now, these are, these are small molecules. You can uh, simulate them using classical methods, but, but they're not trivial. These are, these are interesting molecules with interesting structure. And we really wanted to show that these simulations can match with the known values of, of these very common molecules. Now, why vibration structure? Well, it turns out the vibrational spectrum of a molecule is very important in chemistry for many reasons. The, that spectrum serves as sort of a, a fingerprint, which can uniquely identify uh, molecules, even isomers where the same atoms are in different orientations within a given molecule. It turns out also that the vibration spectrum is very important to understand how chemical reactions take place. It can help you understand both these transitional structures that happen as two molecules come together, as well as the equilibrium at the end of a chemical interaction. And it also helps us understand thermodynamic quantities like free energy which are important in chemistry. 
Now, I, I won't lie, these are molecules are small enough, we can simulate them classically, but the point of doing them on a quantum computer today is to develop these algorithms and techniques so that as quantum computers become larger and more powerful, we can use the, refine these techniques and then use them to simulate larger systems, which are not possible on today's classical computers. So on the next slide, let me show you exactly how this was done. So you start with your molecule. In this case, I've drawn the water molecule there. And you want to map the quantum state of your molecule onto this programmable quantum state of your qubits. Now, there's a lot of neat math that went into this, this first step, because although the water molecule has many electrons and is very complicated, if you're just looking at the vibrational states of this molecule, you don't have to represent all of that information. You have to map only parts of the molecule onto your quantum system. And through a lot of really neat math tricks, Cunisys was able to do this onto just two qubits on our device. Now, Honeywell System Model H1, the computer they ran this on, has 10 qubits. So in fact, when they reduced this down to a two qubit problem, it allowed them to run five instances of this problem in parallel. So a very efficient use of the resources they had. And the way they map this, this molecule's quantum state onto the quantum state of our qubits is through something called a variational algorithm. They write down a quantum circuit, as shown on the screen here, and then they vary these parameters until the quantum state of these qubits matches the quantum state of the molecule of interest here. Now, this optimization, this variation of these parameters can be done either classically or on the quantum hardware. And in this case, it was done classically because we wanted to focus this demonstration on the next part of the algorithm. Once you found those optimal parameters and you can program now your qubits to look like the water molecule, the job's not done. You still need to measure something on this molecule to extract the vibrational energies. In this case, what you're after is something called the Hessian matrix, which has derivatives of the energy with respect to the position of these two atoms in the molecule. And Cunisys developed an, an algorithm that measures these energy quantities and populates that matrix. The details of which are really neat, but I don't have time to go into today. So I'd refer you to the paper on the screen uh, in PhysRev Research. So by first programming the, the qubits to look like the water molecule, and then using this algorithm to measure the energy derivatives on the quantum computer, the output then is this Hessian matrix, a list of energy values, which then can be diagonalized classically to extract this vibration methods. So just as Maria said, the things that classical computers are good at will do on the classical computer. Math is one of those. But representing the quantum states and measuring these quantum values, that all happens on the quantum hardware. On the next slide, we can see the results for the water molecule. At the top, we have the known value for these vibration uh, mode frequencies. And in red, we see the value from the quantum computer. And you can see in the bottom table that these ma values match within a percent or two and is consistent with the sampling noise we'd expect from the limited number of shots that was run on the quantum computer. So very good agreement. We're able to accurately simulate the vibration modes of this water molecule. On the next slide, we can see the results for the methanol molecule, a more complicated molecule, and they're able to extract the first 12 vibrational levels in this case. But again, we see very good agreement uh, within a few percent and largely consistent with the sampling noise we would expect from a variation algorithm. So this is really exciting. They're able to accurately represent the vibration levels of these small but still interesting molecules and give us the tools we need to scale this up to larger systems as the hardware increases in capacity. So on the next slide, we can see that we have two systems available on Azure Quantum right now, Honeywell System Model H0, which is an older system, which has six physical qubits, and System Model H1, which is used for these demonstrations today, which has 10 physical qubits, and a limiting fidelity set by our two qubit gate fidelity of greater than 99.5%. And we're really excited for you to get on and use these systems to do similar demonstrations and really push the limits of what's possible algorithmically to understand the, the quantum world around us. Thank you, Brian. That was fascinating. I hope that together we convincingly demonstrated that Azure Quantum provides great tools and ecosystem for starting to experiment with quantum computing and quantum hardware today. If you want to learn more about the tools we talked about today, I encourage you to check out the great learning resources we have, including documentation, Microsoft Learn modules, and hands-on programming exercises on quantum computing. We will also be happy to have you join our Azure Quantum Developer Workshop 3, in which we will offer a deeper dive in much the same topics. Thank you.